This is Tucker Carlson with Josh Hawley. Josh Hawley is a senator from Missouri, I believe. Uh, he was somebody who used his own son's medical condition in a campaign ad to say that he would never vote <laughs> to undermine people with pre-existing conditions and then, of course, supported repealing the ACA. Uh, though I do think this clip is important because I think the standard liberal response to this is not going to do the job we need it to do. But let's we, we will note the obvious hypocrisies of this, but uh, there needs to be a bigger strategy. Let's watch uh, Tucker Carlson and Senator Hawley. What's so interesting is the left is suddenly in the position of defending the prerogatives of the ruling class. I mean, here you are, a Republican, taking up for the interests of people who, you know, make 40 grand a year. And yeah, liberals and I, are saying, you know, th those people deserve no attention and stop criticizing George Soros because... <laughs> He can't be criticized. Is that weird, do you think? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's it's totally weird. But listen, I mean, the liberals are increasingly the party of the elites. I mean, they are the party of yeah. the ruling class. And that's the point. And that's what they don't want to admit. They are the ruling class. And they have been for decades. They control the commanding heights in this country, the media, uh, the big multi multinational corporations, our universities. I mean, they have effectively run the country, the liberals have, for decades now. And their consensus. There's one thing the elites hate, it's tax cuts. This has given us what we have today. I mean, they're the ones who are responsible for jobs offshoring. They're the ones who are responsible for wages flat, for the, the plight and struggle of working Americans. You know, working Americans, ordinary Americans in places like where I grew up in rural Missouri, they just want somebody to speak for them and to be constantly told that they're bigots and they're racist and their lives don't matter and their views don't, they're tired of that. Well, you clearly are. Did, very quickly, did it ever occur to you to sort of put your head down? I mean, they basically hit you right in the face rhetorically the second you gave that speech. You don't seem intimidated. Did, did you ever pause and think, ah, it's not worth it. I'm going to stop talking like this. Oh, no, because I knew as soon as they were hitting me that we had hit the nerve and that we were on the right track. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew right. then that yeah. what we said was right, and I'm more determined than ever to speak up for the people who don't have a voice, who have been ignored by the elite for too long, and who, by the way, are the backbone of this country. Amen. So nicely put. Good for you. Godspeed. What a charlatan, man. That's the word, is definitely charlatan. But let's work it backwards, because look, there's the obvious stuff that everybody's going to jump to here, which is, okay, who's actually been in charge of the country for decades? Look, if you want to redefine the word liberal and use it in its classical sense, maybe. Okay, sure. It's been oligarchs who represent a 1% agenda exporting jobs, slashing social safety nets, redistributing income to the top, and also pursuing incredibly uh, regressive and racialized criminal justice policies. And in fact, all of the dynamics they're talking about always hit the peripheries first, whether that's primarily white people in Appalachia or primarily uh, people of color in inner cities, as an example. And so, and we also know how Holly votes. He doesn't, he's never said, I oppose the tax cuts. He doesn't have a bill to break up Silicon Valley monopolies. He doesn't have a bill to implement a financial transaction tax on Wall Street or a wealth tax or anything like that. We know all of this. And this is actually a very interesting juxtaposition because Tucker Carlson as a media personality can have have more room to occasionally deviate on actual policy issues to feed this brand. As a politician, when at the end of the day you're a Republican, so you're funded by an incredibly narrow set of elite financial interests, there's a lot less room for the substance of pretend populism. And of course, I will say, I mean, the controversy was stoked up because of the word he used, cosmopolitanism, which some people think codes for anti-Semitism. I like the word cosmopolitanism, actually, and I like the, the connections with solidarity. I will say this. This, though, is something that needs to be dealt with uh, on the merits and, on, and substantively, right? So it's like the reality is, is that if you define most people that think still would conventionally define, quote unquote, liberal as just democratic leaders, well, that's true. No one's a bigger free trader than Barack Obama or Bill Clinton. All politicians from both parties have absolutely implemented a pro-Wall Street, pro-Silicon Valley agenda, 100%. That's absolutely true. And as long as you have the politicians, whether they be Joe Biden or Christian Gillibrand or you know whoever else who cloud the difference on those core issues, that is going to allow charlatans like this to cloud the issues as well. 
the smaller cultural point is interesting because I see it's so obvious when you say these people are the backbone of America, that is white supremacist politics. That is a dog whistle to white identity politics. And that is the lifeblood of the Republican Party and Hawley and Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson and all of it. That's undeniable, period. And that can run on a spectrum from, you know, I don't even get when I'm doing racism. I'm so uncultured into it, but I respond to those cues to Stephen Miller, right? I have no doubt Stephen Miller knows exactly what he's doing, okay? And, and, and all these other uh, groups and party officials. At the same time, when I see a Twitter thread from a Democrat, and I won't go into specifics, saying like rural Americans should shut up and stop whining because they have it lucky because of like some graph on where, go on where tax dollars go, relatively speaking, trash moral, intellectual, and political trash. And this is another area where if you're denying the racialization of that rhetoric, you're denying the reality of America. That's first and foremost. But secondarily, if you don't think that there is a broad-based discourse that concentrates in elite circles, and elite circles that obviously transcend partisan lines, that has a disdain and a disrespect and a contempt for working people of all kinds, then you're delusional. You're wrong. And it so happens right now that in a certain part of center-right democratic neoliberal discourse, they have their own version of the undeserving and deserving poor. And it's flipped. And so now the deserving poor is white people and working class people and people from certain parts of the country that they have disdain and contempt for. And you know what? That's a big problem. That's a big moral and political problem. And it's strategically self-defeating and it opens the room for these people to make critiques like that. And I can already hear some people objecting and freaking out. And if you're not able to understand that I've just said 100% that this is also an appeal to white supremacy, and I've also given zero ground on any policy or a cultural overture politics to white identity politics. But I have said, and I will clearly continue to state, that there is, in certain quarters of media, politics, obviously business, and some of those people who fall on the Democratic side of the dial absolutely have a contempt for rural, for basically poor white people, however that's defined. And if you can't get over that, and realize, again, the very obvious choice, which is like, look, if you're making $45,000 a year and you're white and you live in Missouri and you're voting for Trump because you think Elon Omar backs al-Qaeda and you want to put kids in concentration camps, it's not even that complicated. Fuck you. <laughs> We're going to win. You're going to lose. We're on opposite sides of politics. And that's not the majority and of people in not, rural America. That is absolutely not the majority of people in rural America. But if you can't get that it, actually the majority of people in rural America are people who have been fucked over by credit card companies and trade agreements and all the other things that have so hurt most people in this country in a material, real way that makes up most of their lives, and you think, and again, let's be real, because most of the policy set of even so-called woke Democrats are still actually quite right-wing and quite corporate-friendly, you will not only be morally and politically and policy-wise wrong, you will be doing the work of assholes like this. Because if you had the Democratic Party of people who speak clearly and plainly for real people, whether it's Rashida Tlaib or Bernie Sanders or Ilhan Omar, whoever, and real working people in Appalachia, Missouri, whatever, Canarsie, that would pop the tires out of this shit. But as long as people indulge in that, it leaves an opening. So, you know, and so I'm not going to, especially with Tucker, because it's potent. I'm not going to just play clips and point out that he's a hypocrite and an asshole. Everybody knows that in this circle. Tucker Carlson's a racist. He's a hypocrite. He's an asshole. 
How you actually defeat him and defeat Ollie is going to take some actual strategic assessment and the reaction that people have against rural America and a different narrative of deserving poor people uh, is fucked up, stupid, and gives them room. So I'll leave you with that.